Here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University, we are deeply committed to high impact scientific discovery. We ask important questions with deep consequences for humanity as we explore the great unknowns of the Earth, our solar system, and the universe. With faculty in astronomy, cosmology, geosciences, planetary sciences, exploration systems engineering, and science education. We are breaking down the boundaries between these disciplines to answer the biggest questions that cannot be answered within a single discipline. are designed to challenge students, to encourage critical thinking and scientific inquiry, and to inspire exploration. At the school, we're exploring all of Earth's continents and looking at the future in terms of climate and water supplies. We study astrobiology and seek to understand the relationship between life and a planet. We're at the very center of the community trying to understand whether Mars is habitable, maybe even in the present day. We have one of the largest collections of meteorites in the world, the largest at any university. And we have some of the best university facilities for building flight instruments and spacecraft for exploring our moon, planets, asteroids, and the unknowns of the universe. Here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, we are combining the strengths of science, engineering, and education to set the stage for a new era of exploration of our Earth, our universe, and of the future. Okay, well, um, my name is Minnie Wadra and I'm director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. You just saw um, a little bit of the video explaining what we do in our school. Um, and it's my, my real pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to tell you a little bit about uh, the kind of work, the exciting stuff that we do here in our school, and uh, hopefully to make you feel like you have a place in this great endeavor of, of exploration. Um, so our school really represents a very unique community. Uh, it's by design meant to be a place where we combine really diff different disciplines like uh, cosmology and astronomy, astrophysics, with geochemistry and geophysics and planetary science, uh, along with astrobiology and engineering and science education, all of these fields, because we really are seeking to explore and understand the workings of the earth, the solar system, the universe, and we aspire to answer some of the biggest questions that there are that really can't be addressed within a single discipline. And so, you know, in the school, we really, um, care very deeply, of course, about our educational and our research mission. Um, but we care more also about creating a community um, that's really passionate about pushing the boundaries of exploration, about connecting with the communities that are around us, and also about supporting each other and helping each other succeed. So that's really, that's really what we're passionate about and that's really what we care about. We care about the success of our students. Um, and in this school, we really hope that, um, you know, if you join us, then you'd be learning skills that you'd need to succeed in a variety of careers, whether it's in graduate school, whether it's in industry, whether it's in government labs, whatever it is that you aspire to do, um, you'll learn a variety of skills, including uh, science communication um, through our many community engagement programs. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to participate in research for example, through NASA space grant uh, uh, opportunities and through other scholarship programs that we have available as part of our school. Uh, one of the key experiences that we offer our incoming first year and transfer students um, is a course called Camp CC. And uh, this is actually an introduction to ASU and to the school and to our community in the school. And as part of this course, we actually do a three-day um, trip to the ASU facility at Tonto Creek Camp. And um, we'll be showing you briefly here a video uh, that shows some of the highlights of that uh, experience. So hopefully, let, let's, uh, let's see that video here, Kim. Just 
down a brand new adventure Step up, step out and enter in There's no time, no time for stalling The wild, wild is calling When you risk it all So uh, next, you're going to hear from some of our incredible faculty in the school who will tell you a little bit about the exciting things that are going on in terms of our research um, and some of the opportunities that you will have to get involved uh, with. And so um, let me start out actually by telling you about where I am and a little bit about what I do for my work. And uh, so we are actually, I am going to flip the camera around here and I'm going to show you where I am which to me is one of the most um, amazing places <laughs> because here we have um, samples of rocks from space. So these are meteorites that were in space floating around uh, for many millennia before they fell on the earth and before they could be collected here and and then studied in laboratories like mine to try to understand something about the history of our solar system, about how planets form, about how actually our Earth formed, and possibly also about how life might have originated on our planet. So this is, we're inside our, what we call our meteorite vault. And this is one of the really unique resources that we have at Arizona State. This is one of the largest collections of space rocks anywhere in the world. It's one of the top collections. And you would have access to these materials to, to, to work on, to study, to understand something about the, the history of our solar system. And so let me show you a few of the samples that are some of my, my favorites. And here, for example, I'm gonna go quickly over here to show you a couple of really amazing rocks that the one on the left-hand side is actually a rock from the planet Mars. And so this is coming from the crust of the planet Mars um, and it was ejected from that planet by a large impact sometime um, about maybe about a million years ago or something like that. And then here we have next to it this lighter colored rock, which we actually think came from the crust of the moon. And so here's, here are some incredible rocks from other planets that we have in our collection. And then, of course, you can see that we have a lot of samples here. We've got something like 40,000, more than 40,000 pieces of space rocks representing something like 2,000 different meteorite falls. And here's another example of one that's one of my favorites. It's one of the more beautiful meteorites. And this is a gorgeous sample that's made up of metal and some silicate. It's actually a gemstone called peridot, the greenish mineral that you see here. And we think this comes from very deep inside of a small asteroid or a planet that actually broke up and so you're seeing the deep interior of this of this small planet and here again we see a number of other samples that we have there's so meteorites are not all the same they're very different types of materials and this is another really one of my favorite ones and this is actually very different because this actually represents some of the earliest 
materials to form in our solar system from the cloud of gas and dust as the solar system was forming. And so if you need to understand exactly what, what the conditions were like when our solar system formed, when the Earth formed, and when the other planets formed, you need to study rocks like these to really be able to understand that. And so here, of course, you know, these, this is a real treasure trove of, of materials that we have access to here, right here at ASU. And then, of course, I have my laboratory here where we um, analyze these materials, again, to understand the early history of the solar system and how planets were formed, possibly also how life originated on our planet. So next up, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip this camera around again. And I am going to introduce you to Chris Grappi, who is uh, a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. He's also the Associate Director for Undergraduate Initiatives. And I'm going to hand this off to him. He'll tell you a little bit about what he does, and then he'll introduce you to a few more of our faculty as well. It was great to talk to you. So here's Chris. Hello, everybody. Like many said, my name is Chris Grappi, and I'm talking to you from one of our spaceflight instrumentation clean rooms here at ASU. So I'm an astronomer by training, but what I actually do is I design and build new instruments to go study how stars and planets form. ASU is one of about a half a dozen universities in the United States that has experience and the know-how design and build instruments for NASA to go into space. We actually do that here. We actually build all of the equipment totally from scratch. And I'm going to show you in this clean room here some of the work we're doing right now. So let me flip the camera around. There we go. And we'll start out with this big thing here. This is called a thermal vacuum chamber. So space missions are very expensive. And we only have one try for the spacecraft and all the instruments on it to work. So we need to do lots and lots of testing to be sure they're going to survive the conditions in space. And this big chamber is basically a space simulator. We can take the instrument we want to test and put it inside. Then we close this big can and suck all the air out. So it simulates the vacuum of space. And then this big jacket on the inside we can either heat up or cool down to simulate the either high or low temperatures you might see in space, depending on, depending on if the sun is shining on you or not. And we actually build stuff here too. And when I say build, I mean totally from scratch. This is Justin Mathewson. Justin's one of the engineers who works in my lab and he's actually a former ASU undergrad who started working in my lab as an undergraduate and then he did such a great job, we wouldn't let him leave. And now he's a professional electronics technician. And he actually builds electronics that will fly on a NASA mission. These are some boards we're building right now for a NASA mission called Gusto, which is actually a balloon the size of a football stadium that will fly almost into space, but not quite, and study the uh, gas that will eventually become new stars and planets. And these are some totally custom-made electronics boards that, in my lab, we designed these and built them totally from scratch. And Justin's the technician who actually puts them together and does all the testing on them. And this is just a small part of all of the stuff we build here. We have instrumentation that's on its way to Mars, on its way to the asteroid Bennu, uh, hardware that's already been at Mars for years. Um, ASU is responsible for the cameras for the new Mars rover that will launch soon. So um, there's lots of opportunities to get involved, not only in the science part of what we do, but also the engineering and building part of what we do. And so next, I'll introduce Hillary Hartnett, who will talk a little more about the work she does. Thank you, Chris, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be here talking to you today. I am not unfortunately in my lab because I'm working from home today, but I'm gonna show you guys a little video, silent film actually, that will play in the background while I talk for a second. And the reason for that is that I wanna show you guys that I am a 
uh, an oceanographer here in the desert. And some of the work that my students and I do is exploring Tempe Town Lake, which is in downtown Tempe. And here I'm introducing what this project is about. And in a few moments, you're gonna see my student Donnie, who's collecting a sample and preparing to take measurements in the field. So while I'm an oceanographer and my background is in chemistry, I'm really interested in environmental systems, both in say an urban environment like Tempe Town Lake, there's Donnie with the pH electrodes, because I'm interested in how people interact with their environment and how say a lake in the middle of a city provides amenities to people, but also ecosystem services to the algae and the fish and the organisms that live in the lake. Now, Minnie told you guys at the very beginning that we're very interdisciplinary. So not only are my students like Donnie, who's an environmental chemist, and my other students who are geology students and astrobiologists, not only are we studying systems here on Earth, but we're really interested in how we can use lakes, rivers, soil systems on Earth to understand what environments might be like on other planets. Perhaps Mars had water in its early history and maybe early in Mars history, life could have survived on the surface of Mars. Or perhaps, I'm gonna stop this video now and I'm gonna unshare so you can see me a little better. But what about planets around other stars? Well, we know there are planets around other stars. It's very exciting. And while we're not gonna go there anytime soon, I work with my colleagues who are astronomers who measure, uh, measure elements in stars and we're working on figuring out how to understand elements in planets. But I use my background as an oceanographer to think about what are the oceans on other planets gonna be like? And could those oceans be habitable the way our oceans are habitable? So if you come to CC, there's ample opportunity to work in people's research labs, right? You can work as a student taking research for credit, or you can get an undergraduate research assistance position where you might get paid, and you can work on these kinds of projects. Um, and so I strongly encourage you to introduce yourself to your faculty. And if you're interested in working in someone's lab, tell them because there's lots of you. And while we can send you lots of emails saying, please come ask us about it, if you come talk to us, we're gonna be very excited to have you come and work in our labs and help us do research. So with that, I'll turn it back over, I think to Chris, and I hope you are uh, enjoying the show. Actually, I think I'm next on the list. Um, and I'd like to say a few things about undergraduate research, and I'm gonna sh share a few slides, um, if you don't mind and talk a little bit about some of the things that I do um, with undergraduate research in CC and at ASU. Um, so I'm a geologist, I study rocks and minerals and I study, I use electron microscopes to study them. Lately, I mostly study meteorites, but I also study high pressure um, experiments and so on. What I really wanna talk about is how research can enhance your education. I run a program called the NASA Space Grant, and this provides internships for undergraduates, paid internships to do research. And the reason why um, you might wanna do research is it's a great enhancement for your education. It gives you a chance to meet faculty and other researchers, and it's a great um, stepping stone for getting where you want to go in terms of graduate school, jobs, internships, and your future. So there are many reasons why you'd want to do it, and it's fun. So I'm just going to show you a few things. This was a student that I had a few years ago that worked with me. Her name was Bailey Walker, and she worked on shocked meteorites, and she used electron microscopy and spectroscopy to understand these materials. But as a, as a space grant intern, she was able to publish her research um, as an abstract for the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, 
attend the conference and present her work. And then she went off to graduate school in Canada. Um, that's her at graduation with her NASA Space Grant sash. Here's another example, Gabriella Huckabee. She was an astrophysics major, studied galaxy outflows and galactic magnetic fields. She graduated with honors and she's now studying astrophysics in the PhD program at UC Santa Cruz. So doing these research projects as an undergraduate, undergraduate is a really great way to help you get into graduate schools if that's the direction you wanna go. I also wanna mention a couple of things that are associated with space grant. One is the Sun Devil Satellite Lab. Um, they are a group of students that build small satellites and this year they had a mission um, to build this CubeSat. They got a grant for $200,000 to build this thing and to launch it into space. They worked with students from five different departments on campus, just did a terrific job. This thing was launched in November and deployed in February. Um, just a terrific example of what students can do. Um, I run a program called Ascend, where students build small payloads and launch them to the edge of space on high altitude balloons. And what we do, and this students from all over the state come together with their payloads. We can build any instruments we want. Students do whatever experiments they want, and we send them up to about 100,000 feet on a balloon. As the balloon is flying across Arizona, we're driving below in SUVs, chasing it down, and we, you, go find it somewhere in the desert. But this is um, a really fun activity, but it's a great way for students to learn about science and engineering um, at ASU. Um, this is what it looks like after we recover the sample on the ground. This is an example of uh, you know, finding it somewhere in the desert. Anyway, we, I want you to enhance your education by getting involved in research at, the, in, at our school in CC. And I think next is Steve Semkin. All right, I'm gonna um, say hello to everybody and uh, thanks for attending. Uh, my name is Steve Semkin and I'm a professor of geology and education. And um, I, this little presentation I think maybe could be subtitled, Oh, the places you will go. Um, basically the roots of our school are in the department of geology and people who study planets are basically, you know, much of their work involves geological sciences. So we are a school of earth and space exploration. So we're interested in exploring the earth, exploring the environments of the earth, exploring the history of the earth, exploring the hazards of the earth so that we can live better and more safely with them. And then carrying that knowledge out beyond the earth to the solar system and beyond to, to um, exoplanets to the planets of the solar system as well as to the to the materials that come here to earth the meteorites that that uh, Minnie was talking about but uh, my research is basically on the teaching and learning of geology I'm I'm interested in in the best ways that we can teach geology to next generations of students to get them fully prepared for all the different career pathways that are possible I mean there's so many different careers available to you as a geological scientist and you know even on Earth, but also in space. Again, if you're interested in planetary science, then a lot of the preparation for studying planets will be geology. And so um, Arizona State University is, has the very good fortune of being here in Arizona, which is one of the most amazing places on Earth to study geology. And I'm, I'm a dyed in the wool southwestern geologist. I'm actually broadcasting from the Verde Valley right now in, in the field up here up in, in north central Arizona. But I want to just show you sort of a little a little slide travelogue of, of teaching and learning geology in the field and the places where our students go. If you're if you're going to be a major in CC at ASU, whether it's in geological sciences or astrobiology or many of the other majors, earth and environmental studies, chances are that you'll be taking at least some courses in the field. And I want to show you a little bit about some of the really cool places where our students get to study geology and, and even eventually do research later on. So we tend to start very close to home. This is Dreamy Draw Park in the Phoenix Mountains, right outside the downtown. We usually start our students looking at geology very close to home because we have spectacular geology right here in Phoenix City Parks. So here we have some of our students at Dreamy Drop Park 
Uh, this is an introductory field geology course that I teach. And you can see they're, they're pretty close to the city. Um, so they don't have to go far. They go out for the day and, and uh, have some fun and learn about rocks. And then they, then they go home at night. Um, and then we sort of go from there. We go a little bit farther afield. So this is a place called Arnett Creek, which is near Superior, Arizona. And this is about a 50-minute drive east of downtown Phoenix and east of Tempe. Uh, again, really good geology. And what you see here, these are students who are learning how to map rocks. They're learning how to interpret rocks in the field and to represent their interpretations in terms of uh, notes they take in their in their notebooks and also creating a, a what's called a geologic map which is a map of the way that that rocks are arranged in time and space in a given location and we do this anywhere we do this on the earth we do this on planetary bodies it's one of the ways we understand how these bodies evolve um, one of the real important rules of doing field geology i'll point out rule number one many would say is to always have a great place to have lunch and, and so here we are, we have our field geology students that are taking a break for lunch out in the desert. Uh, this class meets in March, so the weather's like almost perfect and we're out there really enjoying ourselves. Um, here they are in that same area hiking. You can see it's absolutely spectacular landscape in which we learn geology. Not too far from home though, those are the Superstition Mountains in the background, that's Weaver's Needle right there. And indeed, the students definitely seem to enjoy these, these trips out here. So. There's, there's one of our field geology classes at the end of a, what we call mini camp during spring break that, that uh, takes place for four days out again near Superior. And they seem to have enjoyed themselves tremendously. They've certainly learned a great deal. Then we have our summer field camp and Professor Sharp, who just spoke a moment ago, actually leads that. And we take that students up to the Mogollon Rim country, not too far from Payson. And there's Professor Sharp bringing the students out in the field on the first day, sort of getting to know the location. Um, it's nice because this is the rim country. We go up in the early summer when it's getting kind of warm in Phoenix and it's still relatively cool and shady and certainly very pretty up here where students study in the rim country. So they're looking at, at the geology of the Mogollon Rim, which is actually very similar to the geology of Grand Canyon. It's kind of like going to Grand Canyon, a little bit closer to home, just looking at one side of it. Um, if you're interested in fossils or mineral crystals or rocks, one of the really cool things about being a geology student is you, you find that stuff in the field all the time. And many students start a collection, which they'll use in their, their studies and their research later by, by finding things in the field. And here's a nice view of, of what's called Box Canyon just outside of, of uh, Payson. This is where we have our summer field camp. It's a really spectacular location. And there's Professor Sharp cooking. We camp out at this one. And uh, Fresh Sharp is cooking up. Everybody eats really well on these field camps. And then there's a tent here where we, we do our work at night. The work is, we keep pretty busy in summer field and students do work after dark, sort of preparing their notes and working on their maps. And so we have a very professional setup for them to work. There's always something new to learn, always something really exciting about being out in the field. And there are also cupcakes to be had. So a good combination. And then lots of time to some downtime to uh, to enjoy yourself being out in the field and enjoy the weather and enjoy your the company of your fellow students. Um, just a few more pictures from the field. Here's one of one of our students who has stumbled upon a dinosaur bone. That that big white block that he's got under his hand there is actually a dinosaur bone in the field in northern New Mexico. That we were doing some work up there and some studies and we found dinosaur fossils. Um, students near Superior on the side of a, of a volcanic mountain slope. Um, here's a class that went out to the Big Maria Mountains in far eastern California on the California-Arizona boundary. Again, this is a desert field trip. That's Professor Steve Reynolds. He and I co-led that course. Uh, absolutely spectacular location. Uh, some of the students on that class keeping a, a good and safe distance away from an abandoned mine, but finding a, another good place to have lunch and collect some beautiful samples of, of blue and turquoise colored copper minerals in this location. Uh, this is Round Rock on the Navajo Nation. The students take a class there to study the sedimentary layers that are found there. Uh, Ship Rock, New Mexico, a classic uh, volcanic locality in the Four Corners area on the Navajo Nation. The students are looking at a, uh, a big wall of rock called a dike. And then the ship rock itself is that monolith in the background. Um, and then we also, if you're interested, we also have the opportunity to see geology, not just on foot, but also on a raft. This is a video that was filmed by one of the students on the class that we took. This is the San Juan River in Southern Utah. And hopefully this will show up okay. So here we are enjoying 
a river trip in the process of doing geology. A little exciting. So the canyons of the Southwest are indeed some of the most amazing places to study geology. And of course, this is the Grand Canyon State and our students get plenty of exposure to Grand Canyon. We go up there in many different classes. One way we look at it is from the rim where we hike the Trail of Time, which is a geological timeline along the South Rim. And we can study the rocks that are deep in the canyon without actually having to go all the way down in there. Sort of a good way to get introduced to the magnificence and the geological story of Grand Canyon. So we have classes that where we, we spend time on the rim and look at that, but we also go down into the canyon itself. We have a number of classes where you have, if you have the opportunity, you'll get to go down and explore the canyon, sort of the back country of the canyon, and also river trips. It's, it's really an amazing opportunity to, uh, to study the geology of the Southwest from a raft going down the Colorado River and Grand Canyon. And so our students do often get that opportunity if they take the right classes and they're interested in doing this. So I certainly, I would, if you're coming here and you're going to take geology classes, I would certainly encourage you to uh, find an opportunity to, to go with one of the professors on a, on a trip down the Grand Canyon. And we can hike up side canyons. This is a place called uh, Hanst Rapid in the canyon. And then this is Diamond Peak. So we're looking at, at, at all of these. It's basically a nice long trip down the canyon. It takes a couple of weeks. Students also go to places like Petrified Forest. Here's a class of Petrified Forest National Park. One of the things that we're also working on is trying to make our field trips more accessible to people who have uh, mobility disabilities or challenge with, uh, with mobility, any kind of access. We don't want to keep field opportunities away from these students who are also you know, very interested in geology. So we're working on rendering more and more of our field trips accessible in, in lots of different ways. Um, here we are at, after a, a trip on, at uh, Petrified Forest at uh, hobnobbing with the dinosaurs. We also have been working on accessible field trips in other parts of Arizona, including Grand Canyon. And this is Sunset Crater, the volcanic national park outside of Flagstaff. We also travel to other parts of the Southwest. This is actually across the border in Northern Sonora. This is the Pinacate volcanic field. And the students here are studying this gigantic explosion crater in this volcanic area just south of the border. And this is the class there. So basically, I just wanted to give you sort of a taste of, of just being in the Southwest, being a geology student at Arizona State in the Southwest, you have the opportunity to travel to some amazing places, places that not too many people get to see and learn about the earth firsthand. So I would certainly encourage if you come here to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to explore this wonderful field laboratory that we have all around us in the Southwest. And I will go ahead and stop sharing. And I think I will be Passing on, I'm not sure who gets it next, Kim, but. Uh, I'm going to share a video from um, Professor Aerosmith, and then it'll be back to Chris. Okay, thanks. Everyone, I'm Ramon Aerosmith. I'm a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University, and I wanted to provide just a very quick welcome and overview to my research group. And our laboratory is largely in the field, and also uh, we use a lot of high resolution topography. And so, wanted to just use this as an opportunity to show some, some cool imagery. So, this is a strip of meter scale topography along the San Andreas Fault in Central California. See these really kind of cool, strange patterns of the structures. Here's a double stand, stranded piece of the fault zone. And uh, things that are uh, 
interesting to me is how does this structure evolve? How does it uh, record the history of past earthquakes along this really major fault of California? And here we're flying to the southeast and we come to the southern Carrizo Plain where the data kind of broaden the topography hillshade and this really spectacular feature called the Dragon's Back is here. It's about three kilometers long parallel to the fault zone. It's uh, several hundred meters wide and it's about 150 meters tall and it uh, records kind of progressive uplift and offset along the fault zone and has been a natural laboratory for us to look at the interactions between um, topography uh, or surface processes and tectonic processes and this also was part of my PhD work so always uh, kind of close to my heart. Moving on here's another really interesting project we've worked on. This is a uh, point cloud that was uh, rendered in the browser and it uh, shows us the, the topography. This is uh, about a kilometer in scale over a volcano in northern Mexico, just south of the U.S.-Mexico border. It's called the Tecolote Volcano. And I've been working with Professor Amanda Clark to understand what's going on here. You see these really interesting uh, fractures that are sort of concentric around these vents in the middle here. So this was produced from a, a drone. And this and the, the prior data are uh, available on the Open Topography Project, which is a, a major um, data sharing project for topographic data that I help lead. And then here's a final view of another interesting project. Something that makes me quite excited is uh, the example of an earthquake surface rupture that is uh, from 2008 actually, but we were in the field a couple years ago and you can see some people down there at the bottom and actually also if you look very carefully on the right in the middle there's a white thing is another drone flying but we're using the topography data from the drones and also our field mapping to understand the fracture pattern that was associated with this earthquake rupture and you can see people there making measurements in the field to compare with what we observe from the air but this is probably an unusual earthquake. It probably hasn't happened that many times in this particular fault zone, although there is some evidence of prior events in the landscape. And unfortunately, it was uh, devastating to a local village. And so it reminds us about the importance of studying this phenomenon. So anyway, uh, please don't be shy if you have any questions about these topics or other ones. Uh, please communicate with me. And uh, best wishes. Okay, I think I'm up next. Let me turn my camera back on. So I've left the clean room and gone out into the hallway of IST before where it's a little less loud. So I'm gonna introduce now two of our students who work as docents in the IST before public space and are also involved in student research. And they're actually both in my senior capstone class this year. And that's Stone Woodham and Megan McGrady who are, Megan's actually right across the hallway from me there, and they're gonna give you a tour of the public space of ISTB4, which is our great fancy building here, where the first two floors are open to the public and are kind of a cross between a science museum and a working research lab. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Megan and I am studying astrobiology and biogeosciences and minoring in German. This is now my third year here at ASU. Um, and what I love about ASU is how many opportunities there are to become involved in everything. Uh, for instance, in my freshman year, right from the start, I actually got involved in a research lab with Dr. Heather Troop. And ever since I have been in that lab and the many opportunities that are here at CC and ASU are just incredible to just be able to get into a research lab from right at the beginning. So right now I'm actually working on my honors thesis with uh, Dr. True and I am studying decomposition across dry lands and these are dry lands across the western United States. And it's amazing to get involved just from 
a very early start in your college undergraduate career. Um, so I can actually start our tour. So right behind me was actually the Curiosity Rover. And we have a one-on-one -on -one size of the Curiosity Rover in our lobby right here. Also, we have our front desk. So if you have any uh, questions in the future, come uh, by and feel free to say hi and ask those questions. We also have these clocks, these time clocks of all these different missions we're involved in here at ASU and CC. Um, these are just countdown clocks to the missions or the latch states. That's Dr. Coffee. Uh, we also have um, some examples and these uh, showings of uh, Mars. So this is Phallus Marinaris, one of the largest uh, canyons in our solar system. And then we have a model of the Saturn V rocket with the Apollo missions. And right here is what makes CC so incredible. We have a mission ops room. So this is where we actually communicate different missions and discuss all these incredible opportunities and missions that we're involved in here at ASU. And so usually on the screen, you'll be able to see pictures from Mars with the Curiosity rover. Um, right now, we're actually showing different things. I don't know if you can see that, but we also have all these missions that we're involved in right here. We have one. This is a one-on-one -on -one scale of the Lunar Mapper mission. So that is actually a small um, size in comparison to what you may expect. But over here, we have a bigger mission, which is a NASA mission. Um, and this is the second mission. Right now, we're going to make a model of actually how large this mission is and the spacecraft that's going to it. But it's still in progress. And as you saw earlier, these are the labs that Dr. Groffy showed you earlier. So, so if you want to take it upstairs, there he is. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, my name is Stone. Um, I'm currently a senior at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, where I am double majoring in astrobiology and communication while also pursuing a minor in religious studies. Um, like Professor Groffy said, um, I am a docent here at the school. Um, I'm going to finish the tour of our gallery on, this, on the second floor, um, but I also want to hit on some of the interdisciplinary work that I do. Um, Professor Garvey also mentioned that I'm in his capstone, uh, so senior year is a big year um, to be in a capstone and to be actually doing research. Uh, my mentor is actually Professor Ramon, or Dr. Aerosmith, um, and so it's really cool. I'm also an ASU NASA Space Grant intern where I'm doing a research project involving the intercultural communication techniques and strategies of astronauts on the International Space Station. Um, and so I get to do all this really cool interdisciplinary work of how space and society get to integrate and become this nice, uh, beautiful union. Um, and so these are some of the things that I'm really passionate about. So like Megan showed you, I'm on the second floor um, and the second floor is really well known for its meteorites. Um, you saw some of the meteorites by Dr. Minnie, who uh, was in her lab. Um, and I'm not sure if she mentioned this, but I'm gonna mention this anyway. Uh, but ASU is home to the world's largest meteorite collection for a university or college in the entire world. Um, so I'm gonna turn the camera around. I'm gonna show you just a small fraction of our collection, um, probably to some of the additions that you've seen. All of the meteorites I'm gonna show you are on display. Um, so these are some of our meteorites. Um, we always like to talk about the three different types of meteorites. You have stony meteorites, stony iron meteorites, and iron meteorites. Um, this specific meteorite right here is called Gibeon. He's an iron meteorite. Um, he, yeah, and so it's really cool that we get to study all these different things. Um, we only classify these meteorites specifically from where they come from. So stony meteorites are gonna come from the crust of a celestial body. Stony iron meteorites are gonna come from that mantle, that middle area, and then the, Iron meteorites are going to come from the core. So as you can see, we have a very, um, this is a small fraction of the different collections uh, that we have. Now I'm going to show you some of my favorite meteorites. Uh, the reason why I like these um, specifically is these actually came from the Shailabinks event that happened in Russia in 2013. And there was, and the reason why I was really passionate about this one is because I love this idea that a meteorite impact could actually hit the earth and then actually get 
global news. And so I had this passion uh, for different things around um, the, these meteorites. And so um, this is just a small fraction of our collection. Um, I'm going to go turn around one more thing and I want to show you some of the more interdisciplinary work that we do. Um, something else that I would like to show you is that we actually have a topographical map or a topographical feature in our gallery of the Tibetan Plateau. And so as you can see, this is the Tibetan Plateau. Um, the Tibetan Plateau is where uh, India and Nepal and China, that whole area meets um, with Mount Everest. And so we have this really cool feature that allows you to see the geologic history and the, topogra and the topographics of this area and how we study this elevation. Um, and so with that, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Chris. And so he'll go ahead and close this out. Thank you very much, Stone. And I think now Kim has a video to show once more before we close out our uh, presentation this week. Hey everyone, my name is Justin and I'm a third year geoscientist with the School of Earth and Space Exploration. I chose to come to CC because I wanted to learn at a place where I, can, where I can understand how to think like an interdisciplinary scientist. But after being with the school for a few years, I've come to realize that the school is more than just its constituent degrees, but rather the community as a whole. From CC, I've learned specific values and lessons that I hope to take personally after I graduate from ASU to the real world and change how people think about science and the world around them. Hello there, my name is Alex and I'm a sophomore here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU and I'm an astrophysics major. I chose to come to the School of Earth and Space Exploration because I was familiar with Arizona, I've lived here most of my life, and I knew people who went here that were able to show me the facilities and programs here at CC that really kickstarted my interest in the school. During my time here at ASU the past year, I've become a student guide for our scientific gallery where I get to give tours to K-12 through student groups and teach them more about our school and science. I've joined a cosmology research group where I get to interact with my peers and gain experience. I started researching in my field both with others and with my own project through the NASA Space Grant Internship and I've been involved in and attended numerous outreach events that allow me to not only learn more about our school but also help others learn about us and what we do here. Although I don't have a graduate school selected yet, I want to go, I know that I'm on the right track to being prepared for the future and that I'll have the experience as well no matter where I go. And that's thanks to the School of Earth and Space Exploration which has been such an integral part of the success and opportunities I've experienced in the past years, from the academics and advising to the research opportunities in the community as a whole. The academic and community environment is so open and welcoming that it's easy to find your place and succeed. I really can't convey how great my time has been here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I'd highly recommend it to anyone interested in space and earth sciences who are looking to get the experience and education while also benefit from a great community. Your teachers, your peers, your advisors, everyone wants to see you succeed. And so it's a great environment to really be your best self, as cliche as that sounds. So I really hope you'll join us here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and we hope to see you next year or in the future. Okay, well, that's uh, most of what we have here today. I just want to wrap up by telling everyone uh, once again what a great place we think CC is. As you might know, ASU is a really big university. It's one of the largest universities in the whole country. And that gives you a lot of opportunities, but sometimes it might not feel all that homey. But at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, we only have about 500 undergrad majors, and we have over 50 faculty. So the ratio of undergraduate students to faculty is better than 10 to 1. This gives you a really great opportunity to get involved in our community and get involved in research in a way you might not otherwise be able to at a really big university. So I think it's a way to combine the best of both worlds of both a small community and a large one. So thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, I think we might have some time to answer questions right now in the Q&A or feel free to contact us directly through our website. It's actually my job is the Associate Director for Undergrad Initiatives to help answer your questions. So if we can't answer them now, please email us and we'll be happy to get you those answers. Thank you.
Okay, I do see that there's one question. So I'm gonna turn it back um, to Tanner at the college and see if he can answer that for us. And um, I think that's it. So if anybody has any other questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and if we don't get your um, questions answered today, we will follow up with an email. Thank you. Well, there are two questions so far, and I actually know the, um, the answers to both. So okay. if you're an aerospace engineering student, you can still participate in research in CC, even if you're not a CC major. Of course, we'd love you to be, and we've actually designed our majors so that it's actually very easy to double major in a CC degree and in aerospace engineering. And on top of that, we're working with the Fulton Schools of Engineering to invent new joint uh, five-year master's degrees where you can get a bachelor's degree in CC and then a master's degree in engineering or vice versa. And we hope to have those ready in about a year. And then the second question is, are field research trips and study abroad options offered through the major? Yes and yes. There are lots of field research trips. There are classes, probably more than half a dozen classes that have field research trips involved from single day trips out to two week long field kind of camping trips. And we also have a study abroad program uh, that's run by Professor Amanda Clark where students go and study in, uh, in Italy for, for a semester. And the one thing I don't know is the costs involved. Um, I know for all the field camps, the uh, costs for those are included in the uh, standard course fee charge that gets charged to all ASU students. I can, I can add, Chris, that for um, summer field, we have scholarships available too. Uh, we have different scholarship programs that people can apply for, for support. I can also add to that. Um, for many of the classes, the field trip costs are buried in, are, are part of the tuition that you pay for the class. And so it doesn't cost you extra. For study abroad, study abroad is through the study abroad office. Um, and they do have costs. There are some scholarships available, but most of those study abroad courses are set up so that your cost for study abroad is about the same as it would be for the semester that you were paying tuition to be at ASU. Um, but there are lots of ways to kind of make the finances work. You have to talk with those various offices. Any other questions? Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so. Well, if you do think of them, please feel free to email us. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this event on our website and um, any questions that people ask, we'll be posting answers to that website in a kind of a frequently asked questions uh, format. Okay, then um, I think we're done for today. So I'm just gonna share my screen there and thank you everybody for attending and um, we hope to see you in the future. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for joining us.